first I would like to uh, thank the organizers for the invitation to come and, uh, and give this talk. Um, anesthesia for endovascular therapy is indeed a, a hot topic. Um, but currently the discussion is mainly being led by neurologists and uh, neurointerventionists. But I think that uh, we have to welcome this discussion because it's very rare that uh, our anesthetic management is being suggested as having potential to influence heart outcome parameters in a major disease population. In this talk, I'll give you an overview of the current knowledge within this field. Uh, and in the, in the end, I'll come up with some, uh, uh, I'll come up with a discussion about future research perspectives. Yes, I have no uh, conflicts of interest. So, it's all about whether we should use general anesthesia or conscious sedation for these patients. Um, the main advantage of uh, general anesthesia is that the patient is immobilized and have a secure airway. The main disadvantage is, is unstable hemodynamics and time delay. Concerning the unstable hemodynamics, we have to consider that these patients, they are often have uh, a significant comorbidity. And um, we often use, at my institution, a fair bit of uh, vasopressors to maintain stable hemodynamics uh, in this group of patients. Um, and also to, uh, to maintain a sufficient level of, of blood pressure. And the time delay, yes. It takes time to, uh, to, uh, to make it induction of general anesthesia. Looking at conscious sedation, the advantages, of course, we have an awake patient. It's possible to, uh, make, uh, um, to monitor the neurology status of the patient. We have stable hemodynamics and uh, we have reduced time delay. There's no time delay. It's not the same. We don't spend the same time for for induction of uh, conscious sedation. Uh, the disadvantages of uh, conscious sedation is that it, the main disadvantage is that we have patient movements. Uh, typically, the patients are paralytic in one side and the other limbs, they move uh, uncontrollably and that can really be a problem mainly to the uh, neurointerventionists. Um, another uh, disadvantage is that they have an unstable airway. So when we have to choose between general anesthesia or conscious sedation, we have to weigh all these aspects up. So how do we, do, how do we manage these patients here in Scandinavia? In order to answer this question, I submitted uh, a questionnaire to uh, the anesthesia departments located in uh, the uh, in the 19 um, centers in uh, in the 19 Nordic centers who perform endovascular therapy for acute ischemic stroke. And I hope you can see here that this figure here. You can see the geographical distribution of the centers. And I've also tried to indicate the number of procedures in each center. Uh, it's uh, numbers from 2014 and 2015. Um, you can probably see that most centers, they experienced a substantial increase in the number of procedures. And I think that indicates uh, that this is an, uh, an, an vastly expanding area. Taking a look at the questions, uh, we have, I have sampled some of the most important ones here. And we can see that, um, that most of the departments here they use uh, general they use conscious sedation for uh, they they prefer conscious sedation for for anesthetic management and also a great deal of the departments they have uh, they have uh, guidelines and interestingly there's uh, there's three departments where they only manage to they only manage general anesthesia and in these departments it's the neuro the neuro interventionists who 
provide the conscious sedation or just local anesthesia. But I think the most interesting finding is actually this here because uh, we found out that as much as 37% of the departments were not able to provide an immediate 24-hour uh, response to an, EV, uh, to an EVT uh, request, and that includes my own department as well. And with an immediate response, we mean like, you know, a highly emergent cesarean section or like a response to a level, o, a level A trauma. So this is probably due to resources. At my institution, we only have three uh, neurointerventionists who can manage these patients. And they cannot, uh, there's, it's not possible for them to stay in-house all the time. So that's one of the problems. Out of hours, we have to call a team in uh, to manage this. Uh, of course, the in-house staff can start up, but if they're doing something else, it's a problem, and then we will have to wait. So, yes, it's probably a, a problem about uh, a matter about resources. But it's interesting to see how things work here in here in Scandinavia and the Nordic countries. Um, the concern about the influence of anesthetic management on uh, the outcome after uh, endovascular therapy is mainly due to a substantial uh, number of reports, retrospective reports, who found that uh, general anesthesia was associated with worse outcome compared to uh, uh, conscious sedation. I've listed some of them here. You can see 14 of these papers. They reported that uh, <coughs> conscious sedation was better than, than GA, uh, free neutral, and uh, there's three systematic uh, reviews, all favoring conscious sedation. But the main problems with a, a lot of these papers is that they reported only very limited info on the anesthetics, the type of anesthetics used, and also on the hemodynamics. Uh, basic blood pressure measurements were absent in most of them. And then uh, the overall problem is that in most of these, in all of these pa uh, uh, papers here, there was a large bias because uh, there was a tendency that the patients uh, who were most sick, they ended up in the GA group. So that's a problem about retrospective analysis. Uh, I have an example here, uh, a very recent uh, paper. This is a retrospective analysis of the data from the Mr. Clean trial. The Mr. Clean trial was the first large uh, randomized trial who demonstrated an overwhelming positive effect of uh, endovascular therapy in the treatment of large vessel occlusion stroke compared to thrombolysis. And here, the investigators, they have taken the patients in the, uh, in the intervention arm, and you can see, I have to put on the glasses here, and you can see that, uh, uh, you can see the number of patients in each group. But the main finding is that uh, the, the patients treated under general anesthesia with endovascular therapy, they found that the, the effect there was totally absent in that group. And uh, that was really, uh, that was an interesting finding. Uh, meaning that only treatment without general anesthesia was associated with a significant treatment effect. So um, that was uh, one of them. And I have another one here. Um, let's see. No. Is it? Okay, yeah. Yes, and the reason for bad outcome in... Uh, uh, for the bad outcome associated with uh, endovascular therapy and associated with general anesthesia has been suggested to be due to, uh, to the unstable hemodynamics associated with uh, general anesthesia. And here's a study from uh, Pia, from Salgrenska, and she found that uh, there, was a, uh, uh, there was a higher chance of a poor outcome if patients experienced a fall in blood pressure of more than 40% during the procedure. And you can see that here in the distribution of the modified ranking scores. And another example, this is a study from uh, Davis, uh, published in Anesthesiology 2012, 
they looked at 129 patients, and they found that uh, general anesthesia and blood pressure was independently associated with a bad outcome. And here they found a threshold that if patients had a systolic blood pressure less than 140, uh, then uh, they had an, a higher chance of a poor outcome. So, uh, and there's also been some other, uh, some other uh, studies on, on the hemodynamic influence on, on, uh, on outcome. Um, and then we have some sort of recommendations uh, based on the Davis study and some other studies. Uh, the society, the Snack Society, came up with these ex expert consensus statements uh, paper here. And they, well, they could not come up with some specific recommendation, but they suggested that general anesthesia could be recommended in, in uncooperative and unconscious patients, and sedation could be a feasible option in cooperative patients with an intact airway. Uh, and of course, uh, if there should be an anesthesia provider uh, in place if we should be ready to convert. And they suggested that the based on previous study that the systolic pressure should be above 140 and below 180, maintaining with higher flutes or vasopressors. And then they also mentioned that ra randomized studies are needed in a timely manner. And uh, that's exactly what, uh <coughs> what we have done. Um, three randomized trials, single center randomized trial has just been completed. There's one here in Sweden, in Salgrenska. There's another one in my institution where I'm one of the principal investi investigators with the Goliath study. And then there's the Sester study. Sester study was the first one uh, that came out first to publish the results uh, first. I'll show you some of the results from all three of the trials. Um, yes, this is a Sester study published in JAMA last year, and they actually, they randomized, uh, they, yeah, they had a GA group of 73 patients, and 77 patients had uh, conscious sedation. They have a crossover rate of 14%. Um, yeah. And what they found, oh, it's difficult to see here. They found that this is the baseline characteristics here. They mainly used CT uh, and very few MR uh, scans, but otherwise they had a very balanced, uh, uh, balanced uh, uh, group. And uh, they, the most important thing here is that you can see the National Stroke, National Institute of Health Stroke Scale. That's a scale which measures the severity of stroke. It was similar in both groups, so patients were equally sick in both groups. And here we have the primary outcome measures. And they had the primary outcome measure here in the, in the Shester study was 24 hour uh, stroke outcome. And there was no difference in that. But here, if, we, if they stratify the patients and only look at the patients with good outcome after three months, meaning patients with a modified ranking score zero to two, they actually found that there was a tendency, tendency towards a better outcome in the, in the GA group. So that was a little bit of a surprise. So in this study, no difference on the primary outcome parameter. And here with the secondary one, an indication of a possible, of a possible positive effect uh, of uh, GA. And here we have... Uh, this is the most recent uh, study published, was published here by Pia uh, Hendon in stroke. And they had uh, uh, 45 patients randomized in the GA group and 45 in the conscious sedation group, and they have a 16% crossover rate. And again, the patients were uh, sick, comparable to the Shester study, by chance, they actually ended up having a significant uh, that have a significant difference between these two groups here. 
So patients actually were a little bit sicker in the GA group, but that was, uh, that was by chance. Otherwise, all, all the other baseline characters were equally uh, distributed there. And here we have the outcome parameters. We have the modified ranking score outcome, neurological outcome at three months, uh, and there was no, ch no difference there. And uh, also if they yeah, look at the modified ranking score less than two, there's no difference there at all. But we have to bear in mind that they actually t had a tendency to, to be sicker in this group. So uh, not so bad. And then I can show you our own study. It's not been published yet. This is uh, the, the, paper uh, the protocol paper which we published pr uh, pr prior to the study. But we have finished the study and we uh, put, we randomized uh, 65 patients to GA and uh, 63 patients to conscious sedation. We had a crossover rate of uh, 6%. Here we have the baseline data. We can see that uh, uh, we have comparable groups regarding uh, the stroke, uh, the National Institute of Health stroke score. They were equally sick in, in both groups, otherwise there were no differences between the other parameters. And if we look here at the primary outcome parameter, which in our study was infarct, uh, infarct growth, there was no difference here. But we can see that if we take, this is the, all our patients had MRI examinations, and this was the first, just when they arrived in the uh, before, before treatment. This is the baseline MRI, of course, no difference. But then we measure, we, we repeat their MRI scan again, and you can see here on the diffusion rated scans after 24 to 48 hours that there actually is a significant increase in infarct, uh, the, the, the infarct, in, infarct is significantly higher in the conscious sedation group. But there's no difference in the growth the size of the infarct we, with, uh, with which they end up with is larger in the conscious sedation group. And that was the uh, primary outcome parameter, and no difference there. And then we looked at the 19-day neurological outcome as a secondary uh, outcome parameter, and here we actually found that there was uh, a significant that the group treated with general anesthesia uh, uh, did significantly better. So there was actually better outcome in the group, in the uh, general anesthesia group, but this is a secondary outcome measure. And this is in line with the difference in, uh, in the final infarct group here. So altogether we have now three single center randomized trials on a fairly limited number of patients, and they all show that there's no difference between general anesthesia and uh, conscious sedation uh, with regards to, to outcome. And there's even some indications that some that patients with, uh, who, who, uh, who are anesthetized with general anesthesia, that they may do better. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And just uh, the last slide here, just a future research perspective. We need multi-center trials. We need some pooled analysis of the data from the three studies I've just shown. We need to see whether there's a difference about on the type of anesthetic, whether that will influence outcome. And we also need to look at blood pressure thresholds. Maybe we could individualize the pr blood pressure in, uh, for each patient. It we could possibly do that to, with continuous uh, blood pressure monitoring, autoregulation monitoring. Then we need to look at the influence of timing, workflow, and organization. How does that influence on outcome? And thank you.